Uh, thank you, thank you very much um, for the introduction. Um, I just want to start first by, by really thanking the organizers, uh, particularly Peter Yu and Sean Fine for inviting me uh, to this conference. Uh, I was very excited by, by the topic. Um, so I've been based in Geneva for almost 13 years. Uh, half of them was I spent uh, representing my uh, country, Egypt, to the meetings of the World Intellectual Property Organization and the World Trade Organizations. And uh, in these many years in Geneva, actually, uh, at WTO and WIPO, I've never been with a meeting who had an agenda item on human rights and IP, right? Uh, 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 which is, appears quite uh, interesting in terms of how important is, are these issues for really shaping the entire uh, debate and normative outcomes in these organizations, right? But the issue as such has not, to my knowledge at least, been discussed uh, uh, in this forum. And so it shows you that many of the delegates and the negotiators that, 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 that negotiate uh, intellectual property agreements uh, have not also been confronted to uh, full conceptualization and, and debate such as the one we're having now. I think that has began to change uh, more recently in recent, recent years. And uh, this is thanks also to, 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 to much of the advocacy and the scholarly, the, the, the scholarly work we have, we have seen in this area. Uh, and I just uh, thought to point to one example of where I think uh, this change is happening, uh, and maybe this convergence or at least mutual acknowledgement is occurring, which is the treaty on um, or instrument on limitations and exceptions for visually impaired persons or persons with print disabilities. And I'll try to, 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 to show if, 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 if this, this, this new instrument uh, could be a gap or could help to bridge the gap between uh, international IP law and human rights law. Uh, but my focus really is not to, 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 to really address in detail the provisions of the treaty and the instrument. Uh, they're actually being this, discussed this week in Geneva. There's a, there's a high-level meeting in Geneva that is uh, trying to negotiate uh, some of the, the, the aspects of, the, of this instrument. But my focus really is to try to, to, to look at the interface with human rights. Uh, so, so that's what I'll, I'll spend in particular in the second part of my presentation. So, we are witnessing here possibly a double precedent, really, uh, with this instrument. Uh, uh, and a precedent in terms of international intellectual property law. It's the first time in recent years or many years that an international IP law instrument is concluded to address the need of a group of users of the copyright system rather than right holders. Most of the normative production uh, in IP has been to expand IP rights, uh, 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 but this is the first time we're seeing uh, a treaty that addresses a category of users. So that is, could make it the first precedent. Uh, again, the diplomatic conference is expected to be in June this year. Uh, so, so, so I think all this again is, 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 is we know, there's a high probability this, the treaty will happen, but again, I think this is, this is a couple of months away. The second aspect of this precedent is that it may be the first then international IP instrument uh, concluded at, at, at WIPO WTO that incorporates explicit references to international human rights instruments, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, right? So a double precedent uh, in the making, I think, with, 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 with a lot of um, implications. Uh, very quickly, an overview about uh, this, 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 uh, visually, uh, this treaty for visually impaired persons. Uh, it's, it's called Treaty and Instrument in the official document that's being discussed at WIPO. Why? Because there is still some disagreement whether the form of the legal instrument would be a legally binding treaty or could be a soft law or an instrument. It is likely to be a treaty because if a diplomatic conference is convened in June, diplomatic conferences usually adopt treaties, right? Uh, but it's still, this, this denomination of treaty slash instrument is still used. So what is the background that, that brought this, um, this, this instrument uh, into the stage of discussion where it is now? It is this phenomenon of what uh, was called particularly by the World Blind Union, the book famine. Only 5% of published books are made available in accessible formats for visually impaired persons, such as large print, audio, or braille. So this instrument seeks to provide visually impaired readers access to these works that would be normally unavailable to them under national copyright laws. And in particular, the, the, I think the heart of the instrument is to allow the cross-border exchanges of accessible format copies. And that matters in particular for linguistic reasons, uh, 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 in particular, for example, a Spanish-speaking uh, 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 person, uh, visually impaired person in Latin America would have problems accessing these format copies that are produced for the Spanish market, although it's in the same language. The same language. 
what have been the key dates that have uh, uh, made us arrive to, to, to this, this discussion today? Well, uh, if, if we see quickly, this is not an entirely new issue in the area of copyright. Uh, it has precedence uh, in 1981 already. There was a UIPO UNESCO working group uh, on access by the visually impaired and auditory handicapped to material reprodu reproducing works produced by copyright. Uh, so, so the issue was flagged uh, previously uh, uh, in the history of, 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 of copyright discussions, uh, but it did not reach any outcome uh, at that point. And it was not also the same kind of discussion we're having today, in particular relating to the cross-border uh, exchange. Uh, but I think it's important to, 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 to notice also, I mean, for, from what I know of WIPO, that the World Blind Union is probably one of the oldest non-governmental organizations accredited, or public interest, let's say, non-governmental organizations accredited to WIPO, with the International Federation of Libraries. So the World Blind Union has a, a long presence of, in, in, in WIPO and with copyright issues. The next important uh, date is 2003, 2004. Uh, Chile launches a discussion at the Copyright Committee in WIPO on limitations, exceptions to copyright with a view to discussing having mandatory international limitations and exceptions uh, uh, in copyright treaties. And uh, this kind of the start of a long discussion in, in, in the SCCR on having mandatory limit, limit, uh, lim, um, limitations and exceptions for possibly libraries, for visually impaired persons, for education. And a lot of studies have been done on that. A lot of proposals have been made by countries. At the, same, at the same time, you have uh, the adoption of the WIPO Development Agenda, which is a broad movement that tries to bring balance to intellectual property, to bring a development dimension oriented there. In 2006, uh, you have the UN, United Nations General, uh, General Assembly that adopts, in parallel, uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. In the same year, WIPO undertakes a study on limitations and exceptions for VIP in the national laws of its member countries. And it finds that uh, only 57 uh, uh, countries, among more than 150 countries, have limitations and exceptions for visually impaired international laws. So a relatively small group of countries, and, and, and mostly it is mostly developed countries. So in the meantime, I think the issue starts to come up more to focus, uh, the World Blind Union, uh, 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 with a, lot of, a number of, of advocacy groups, in particular uh, KEI, Knowledge Ecology International, they uh, work together uh, uh, in preparing a draft, the text of a draft treaty on uh, 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 visually impaired uh, persons. And that draft treaty is tabled by Brazil, Paraguay, and Ecuador in 2009 at the Copyright uh, Committee in WIPO. So uh, it's really the, 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 the path, the pace of, of discussion has been relatively quick for, 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 for international organizations. I mean, normally, uh, treaty making takes 10 years or sometimes, and, 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 and so, so we're, this is relatively a, a fast uh, uh, pace of, of discussions. And I think, uh, of course, uh, when this issue comes to discussion in WIPO, I think it, 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 its humanitarian nature uh, really becomes um, very uh, apparent in the, that this is really an exceptional program, a problem, uh, 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 very specific, and, and there's a lot of, I think, sympathy towards addressing it, although there's a disagreement about how to address it. But uh, already in 2011, we found that uh, a, a, a group of countries uh, developed and developing, uh, Brazil with the EU and the US, present a proposal on an international instrument on limitations and exceptions for persons with print disabilities. So again, it tries to bring together a more consensual movement uh, 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 to have this move forward. And I think the big event uh, in, in last year in December, an, an extraordinary session of the General Assembly of WIPO, Convene a diplomatic, uh, decided to convene a diplomatic conference for this June to examine uh, this treaty slash instrument. Very quickly, uh, what, what, again, what does this treaty, uh, its main uh, provisions, it, it, is, it, 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 it obliges countries to have international laws, limitations and exceptions for visually impaired persons for the rights of reproduction, distribution and making available to the public in order to facilitate availability of accessible, accessible formats of copyrighted works. It also the key issue it allows the import and cross-border exchange of accessible format copies, and it does this through a system of authorized entities to make these, uh, these accessible in all countries. So there's still some points of disagreement, actually, uh, uh, in, in the negotiations, in the discussions that are currently taking place in Geneva. Uh, again, I mentioned there's, the, again, still a disagreement on whether it's an instrument or a treaty, although... I think the overwhelming majority of countries uh, are moving towards or, or, or are supporting a treaty. Uh, there was some hesitation about the EU, but I think it has come to uh, a treaty. 
Um, I don't think the U.S. has pronounced the word treaty, but <laughs> I think it is, gonna, is it, I mean, it is likely to happen. Uh, the, refer the, the, the other disagreements are um, the discussion about the reference to the three-step test. <laughs> Uh, some concerns by countries that uh, developed countries are trying to put a wording on the three-step step that would be restrictive compared to what is uh, existing internationally. Uh, again, don't want to get into the details. The issue of commercial availability, so the trigger to use the mechanism of the treaty happen uh, when uh, the issue of pricing and avail commercial availability come into play. So how do you define this commercial availability? Uh, that's another issue. And in general, uh, again, the system of authorized entities. How would, who are the authorized entities? There's a lot of discussion on that. Um, libraries are included, NGOs, but they have to be dealing with persons with print disabilities or disabilities. Again, a lot of discussions around that. Uh, so these are some of the issues that are still under, um, are under, under, under discussion. So now I come to the other, other uh, piece of the discussion, which is the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This was a convention negotiated between 2002 and 2006, adopted in 2006 by the UN General Assembly, signed in March 2007, entered into force in 2008. There's 155 signatories uh, with 127 ratifications of the convention itself and 75 for the protocol. It has an optional protocol that allows, like other human rights mechanisms, uh, instruments, individual complaints. And the United States has not yet ratified the convention, um, when I was here a couple of months ago, I read some press articles about the discussion, uh, kind of a Byzantine discussion for me, uh, coming from outside the United States in the Congress, that this convention could impose uh, to the United States uh, the way it treats disabled people in a way that is not acceptable, etc. What are the aims of this convention? Uh, to promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disabilities, and to promote respect for their inherent dignity. Now, for our interest then, looking specifically at the issue of human rights and IP, the convention has a very important article, Article 30, where states, parties recognize the rights of persons with disability to take part on an equal basis with others in cultural life, right? which echoes a bit some of the, the, the provisions we know in international human rights instruments, enjoy access to cultural materials, enjoy access to television programs, etc. And then, the article continues that state parties also have, should take appropriate measures to enable persons with disabilities to have the opportunity to develop and utilize their creative and artistic and intellectual potential. Again, echoing uh, 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 the, the, the issue of creativity. But then the most interesting provision is the paragraph 3 there that says state parties shall take all appropriate steps in accordance with international law to ensure that laws protecting intellectual property rights do not constitute an unreasonable or discriminatory barrier to access by persons with disabilities to cultural materials. Right? Now, this is very interesting because it is different than the language we find in the Universal Declaration of International Covenant on intellectual property. I mean, one would have thought that we would just have mirrored here the, 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 the language we find in these, in these instruments, but this language goes much further. And, and in my experience of, of negotiations on IP, I've never seen yeah. in a multilateral instrument this qualification of intellectual property rights as an unreasonable and discriminatory barrier, right? Or the possibility that it can be that, right? So, so, so even in the Doha Declaration, we don't find it. We find a reference that uh, trips agreements should be interpreted in a manner supportive of public health. In the Convention on Biodiversity, we find that intellectual property rights should, should not run contrary to the objective of the Convention. But here, there's a very explicit statement that it, 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 we should ensure that it does not constitute an unreasonable or discriminatory barrier. And I would be interested to know more about the drafting history of that and how, how it got to the, this departure from the Universal Declaration and the International Covenant. Now, interestingly, uh, now once Brazil has been playing a leading role in, in, in pushing this, this instrument forward, so the President of Brazil visits the United States in April 2012, and there's a joint presidential statement by the two countries by two presidents, which says, the, president, the presidents reaffirmed the commitment of both countries to the conclusion of an effective international instrument in the world intellectual property organizations that ensures that copyright is not a barrier to equal access uh, to information, so it's missing culture and education. Again, I've never seen a US statement uh, uh, really that has the word barrier and copyright together uh, uh, at this level, uh, really, uh, and, 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 and so it's very significant. I think it shows you the importance of the issue and its really exceptional nature. 
But I think, uh, again, it shows that the language that comes from the Convention on the Rights of Disability seems to have uh, continued the life of its own, and, 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 and it's kind of taking there, it's, 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 it's being entrenched there in a, certain, uh, in a certain way. Oh, I know that there's some people in the U.S. administration that were not happy with this formulation uh, uh, and how it, it, it ended up in the, in the presidential statement, and specifically the word barrier. Uh, because again, I mean, uh, I'll give you an example. In, in 2003, I was involved in the negotiations of the World Summit on Information Society, which is an episode that is not well known, but intellectual property was an issue there in the declaration of the World Summit. And the, the issue of IP being possibly a barrier in the information society was categorically, categorically rejected by U.S. and developed countries, right? To have the word intellectual property as a barrier, impossible. A possible barrier, of course, that, that, is, that is the idea. So I think that the, 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 the coming to, 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 towards the end of my, of my presentation, the here that this, this treaty, this instrument in the making, has really uh, two, uh, uh, two pillars, I think, that, that, that kind of nourish him. And, and one is the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, and the other one is the movement within copyright of this movement for minimum mandatory limitations and exceptions. Right? And there's a lot of doctrinal discussions in the area of copyright when this issue has appeared. Uh, is it proper in copyright to have m uh, mandatory limitations and exceptions? Well, the, this turns out co copyright law and it's on its head. It's a scandal. Uh, the, the international copyright law should only set uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 the, the provisions and, and, and the, the, the limitations and exceptions should be left to the national level to give the freedom of countries to making most use of, 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 of the limitations and exceptions at the national level. But in reality, many mostly developing countries did not have such limitations in their laws or had more restrictive limitations than developed countries, right? So, 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 so I think that is now kind of this discussion has moved forward. And now look, let's look at, at, at the current text of the, the, the legal instrument and, and how it, it's reflecting these two uh, 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 pillars. So in the preamble of the current, the, 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 the yesterday's version of, 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 of the text, so the first paragraph in the preamble recalls uh, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But the second and the third, uh, the second and the third paragraphs in the preamble uh, point to not only point to the human rights of freedom of expression, right to education, and point uh, to uh, 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 the right to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share scientific progress and its benefits, right? So we have the first three preambular paragraphs of the, the VIP instrument that are really on human rights, or address human rights, mention human rights. Now, interestingly, uh, again, uh, uh, this reference to the Universal uh, the, the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was not in the 2008 draft that was presented by Brazil and the, the World Bank Union. Right? It was not there. And again, uh, here there's a little, uh, uh, there's a practical issue. Diplomats and, and national administrations and the foreign affairs, the people dealing with IP are different than people dealing with human rights. So the connection that there was uh, IP provision in the Convention on, on Disabilities that could be useful or had an implication, an echo for the WIPO negotiations, that uh, took some time to be connected and was not self-evident, actually. So that is why we see that this reference to the Convention of Civilities comes at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a quite a more advanced stage. And specifically, I recall I, I, I had raised it with, 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 with some uh, officials that uh, coincidentally there was a meeting of state parties of the Convention on Disabilities in 2009 or 2010 that was reviewing the Convention, actually. So I saw a press item on that. And, and, and so it struck me that it, it, it has the provision on IP. It's very relevant to the discussion at WIPO. Ah, and then the final thing, and the terms not only of the reference in the terms of the text, we have a letter in 2012. And so this is more the procedural effort, the, uh, the interactions of, 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 of the regimes. The chair of the UN's Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, so the chair of this, the, the, the treaty body of the, the, the UN Convention on Disabilities, sends a letter to the chair of the White Post Standing Committee on Copyright. And in the letter, he expressed support for WIPO achieving an international instrument which ensure that copyright is not a barrier to information culture for persons with disabilities, and confirming that a binding treaty of this nature would be in conformity with the spirit of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Now, this is quite amazing because uh, when we see the, 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 the drafting of, of the, 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 the provision uh, in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it says that intellectual property should not be an unreasonable 
or discriminatory barrier, right? But it doesn't say, or then it leaves it open how to address this barrier. Is it by soft law? Is it by technical manners? Is it by a legally binding treaty? And here we have the chairman of the committee that says that a binding treaty is, would be in conformity with the spirit of the convention. So I think this is, I mean, again, in all my years in WIPO, I've never seen uh, a human rights body table such a statement at a WIPO meeting. So, uh, 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 very significant, very significant uh, developments. Now, of course, uh, I think that at the level of the discussion where we are now, and this is my conclusion, I think really this, uh, the VIP treaty is a, really a milestone in the interaction between these uh, two regimes in terms of at least a mutual acknowledgement. Uh, if, again, the text we have now is the one that is adopted in the diplomatic conference. So it's no doubt a very symbolic and important normative development. Uh, whether it is for, because it's such an exceptional issue, it's a, such an immaterial connotation or not, would this be followed by other instruments for libraries, etc.? That's a huge discussion. But again, I think now the critical thing is that uh, it is not the instrument in itself that is the ultimate goal, but how its provisions will be shaped, and whether its provisions will really be effective in providing the solutions needed. And here is all the issue of what I would call the ghost of the burn appendix, right? Is that uh, it is not having an instrument that is the achievement, but that it's practical, that it works, etc. Because uh, uh, the burn appendix uh, uh, did, did not work, was not used, or other instruments that uh, 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 also have practical aspects, uh, such as, as the 2003 decisions of, of, of WTO or for, for uh, countries with, with, uh, who have no manufacturing capacities. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a concern that procedural hur hurdles will undermine the effectiveness of the treaty. So although it's a binding treaty, so and that is very important, but again, it needs to have procedurally the right uh, elements to, to be able to make it an effective uh, solution. Thank you very much.